Most gracious and all wise God, we come before you, Lord, just saying thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you for your healing power. I thank you for your delivering power. I thank you for your loving power. Uh, please be with us today as we go through this lesson. Open up our minds and we may be receptive to what it is you would have us to learn. Open up our hearts that we may put it on the inside and ultimately give you the glory as we share it with others. These things we ask in your mighty and majestic son's name. Amen. All righty. This is the last of our series, Only You Can Be You. And, and this is the fifth tenet, our mandate, uh, of our church, which is expanding God's kingdom. St. Stephen Church exists to expand the kingdom of God. And right off the bat, uh, I'm asking this question. What is the kingdom of God? Well, y'all get quiet on me. Everywhere God rules and reigns. There we go. So now there are some distant places that he rules and reigns. There are some familiar places that he rules and reigns. But our job is... to allow him to reign. So, Psalm 84, verse 20 says, Can unjust leaders claim that God is on their side? Leaders whose decrees permit injustice? The kingdom, of, uh, the word kingdom appears about 88 times across the four Gospels. And now the word church is used twice. In Matthew sixteen eighteen and Matthew eighteen seventeen. Um, in sixteen eighteen, Jesus says, "I say to you, Peter, which means rock. Upon this rock I will build my church, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it." And then in Matthew eighteen seventeen. It says, if the person refuses to listen, take your case to the church. Then if he, he or she won't accept the church's decision, treat them as a pagan or corrupt tax collector. So, the word kingdom is a combination of words king and dominion uh, are to dominate. The kingdom of God is dominating or reigning in all of the affairs of human society, both personal and social. Now, as Christians, we are called upon to expand God's kingdom. <laughs> Jesus said, pray thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we are called to prioritize the kingdom. Matthew 6 and 33 says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness or justice, and all these things will be added to you. Well, what are the first that we should be saying? F, our finances. I, our interest. R, our relationships. S, our schedules. And T, our troubles. So there are a lot of things that we need to be taken before God. Now, the Greek word for righteousness is the same Greek word for justice. It is a Greek word, dikaiosyne. dikaiosyne. Um, prior to Jesus saying, seek first the kingdom and justice, Jesus mentions the basic necessities of life that all people are in need of. In Matthew chapter 6. He says we are in need of food. We are in need of fitness or body care. We are in need of clothes or fashions. We are in need of finances. So five times in that passage, he says, don't worry about them. Because we are more than 
our food, our fitness, our fashions, and our finances. Um, Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. This is why I tell you, do not worry about everyday life, whether you have enough to food and drink or enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? In verse 27. In all your worries, add a single moment to your life. No. In fact, it's going to subtract it for you. Matthew chapter 6, verse 28. Why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. <laughs> they don't work or make their clothing. Matthew six thirty one. So don't worry about these things, saying, what will I eat? What will I drink? What will I wear? Verse 34. Don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worry. Today's troubles is enough for today. So Jesus says the way that uh, we're provided for uh, is to be seen by seeking justice in society. The reason many people don't have this is because of injustice. Justice is ensuring that fair access to resources and food, clothing, water, housing, education, and health care are provided. God has distributed enough of these things of life to meet human need, but not human greed. So hoarding and greeting or being greedy in basically in the face of everything is a sin. We saw evidence of this with the rich man in the parable about Lazarus and Davies, where he went to hell because he tolerated injustice and disparities between him and poor beggar Lazarus. All Lazarus wanted was the crumbs. The, the dogs are getting more crumbs than he was. Justice seeks to close the gap between the has and has nots. <laughs> he is in Luke chapter 19 um, tells us what the kingdom looks like. So, what does that look like? Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 9, tells us, Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through the town. There was a man there named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector in the region, and he had become very rich. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short and could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead, climbed in the sycamore tree beside the road, for Jesus was going to pass that way. When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him Zacchaeus. He said, quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. But the people were displeased. He has gone to the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half of my wealth to the poor, Lord. And if I cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. And Jesus responded, salvation has come into his this house today. For this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. So, what does justice look like? The number one cause of disparities in society is public policy. Basically, you have three types of policy. You have private policy, which is how we think. 
Um, it's generally between us and God. We have personal policy, which is how we behave. And then we have public policy, which is how the resources of society are distributed. Now, social justice is concerned with how public policy favors the rich and the powerful over the poor and marginalized. The white Christian evangelism often rejects social justice. They often advance uh, personal gospel that makes the gospel only applicable to people's sins. However, social justice gospel recognizes that sin is not simply personal, it is systemic. In fact, public policy uh, affects private and personal policy. All right, here is my first official point to ponder. What policy has been made recently that affects women. Change in abortion law. That is correct. Now, the father of the social gospel movement, a Baptist preacher named Walter Russian Bush, said, saintly folk will act like sinners when they for days have had no dinner. So when public policy concentrates wealth and opportunity with the elite and greatly restrict opportunities for the poor and marginalized, the outreach often engages in untoward behavior. The white evangelical Christian Christianity of Al Mohler, who is the president of the Baptist Theological Sem Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, and Franklin Graham will argue that people are poor because they of how they behave. Now, here's the next point for me: Is that true? Of course not. No, I ain't true, Dave. Okay. Social justice says people behave the way they do because they are poor. The number one cause of disparities in society is public policy decision on behalf of the government. <laughs> Racism is defined by Ibram X. Kendi as racial disparity, disparities created by racist policies justified by racist myths. And you'll see there's a whole list there of mortality rates for black folk. Um, just because People are not thinking. Well, what does Psalm 9420 say? It says, unjust leaders cannot claim God's support. It says, unjust laws are laws that permit injustice. And it says, God always takes sides with the victims of injustice. We've been brought up to believe in a God who for all who is for all people and that God's love is indiscriminate. However, this view of God is false and unbiblical. God is on the side of the tortured, not the torturer, the slaves, not the slave master. We saw evidence of this when he called Matthew, I mean when he called Moses in Exodus chapter 3, where it says, starting verse 7, Then the Lord told him, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. So that right there lets us know that we have a God who's looking down on us. I have heard their cries. So I've seen them. I've heard them. The cries of distress. 
because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I'm aware of their suffering. <coughs> so I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile, spacious land. It is a land flowing with milk and honey. The land where the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites now live. Look, the cry of the people of Israel has reached me, and I have seen how harshly the Egyptians abused them. Now go, for I am sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people, Israel, out of Egypt. So, this main outline for this story is there's a class struggle between the oppressed and the oppressor. All right, here I go again. Where do we see this class struggle today? Hello? Right now it's in the political part bad. Okay. Well, how so? Well, Dave, we got so much going on with each other, and just be honest, twenty-five, he's just out of out of whack. He's it's just like he wants to send us all back, as they say, to Africa. Well, here's the funny part: Africa yeah. don't want us. Right, ain't that the truth? They don't. So, this class struggle between the oppressed and the oppressor. Okay, let me ask you this. Can black folk be the oppressor? Yes. How so? Are we killing each other? Well, I don't think we got the resources to oppress nobody. We ain't got no resources. Yeah. Yeah, but certain parts of town uh, appear to have those resources. It sure ain't West Louisville. I had gone shopping for somebody, and I used their food stamp card to go shopping for them. And the card had not been activated. So I'm standing there tripping over why this card is not working through. And the black manager walks up to me, and I said, is there any way you can just leave these right here? I'm going to run out to my car, grab another car, and I'll be right back. She said, they'll be here for all of five minutes. Because I don't know how you people use your cards. And at that point... I got a little irate, and I said, sweetheart, I pray that nothing ever befalls you uh, so that you need to learn this element of humility. So there's a class struggle between the oppressed and the oppressor. God is aware of this struggle. God takes in the struggle in favor of the oppressed. And what is God calling us to do? Join the struggle. Nothing points out how God takes sides with the oppressed, like Exodus chapter 14, verse 25, where he says, The Lord is fighting for them, that's the oppressed, against Egypt, the oppressor. Now, many people have been oppressed for so long that they've internalized it. Internalized oppression is when oppressed people are conditioned to accept their oppression as appropriate, as inevitable, as believing, believing themselves powerless, and to produce change and lose hope. Well, 
Exodus chapter 6, verse 9, Moses told the people of Israel what the Lord had said, but they refused to listen anymore. They'd become too discouraged by the brutality of their slavery. So the call of Moses is God saying to Christians, I'm calling you to join the fight against, uh, to advance justice. True conversion to Christ is a conversion to the total purposes of Christ. Can we truly say that we love our neighbor and not be concerned about the neighborhood our neighbor lives in? The ultimate goal of Christian faith is not what happens in the church on Sunday. The ultimate goal for the Christian faith is what happens the other days in society. Because it's during those other days that we interact with other people. And it's during those other days that they either get to see Jesus in us or they get to see the devil in us. Well, how do we go about bringing this kingdom? You pray that you honor the establishment of the kingdom of God in all that you do. There are some things that you should not be doing because they are not furthering the kingdom of God. We also need to encourage others to do kingdom work. There are lots of folks that don't have anything to do. We should be encouraging them to go work at a shelter. Uh, go work at a couple of the uh, clothing distribution places. You also need to share with others how Christ died for us to know what it looks like to love our neighbor. Uh, by the way, who is our neighbor? Is it the person that lives next door? Everybody's our neighbor, Dave. Everybody. Everybody come everybody come in everybody. And that's what we need to know. Our giving allows the building up of God's kingdom. And although you may have been in an oppressive state throughout your life, the good news is deliverance is available through Christ. Well, I pray that something's been said that uh, has helped you along your journey so that you too get to know Christ and you too get to represent him in all that you do. So, all right, here I go meddling again. What are some ways that we can expand God's kingdom? Uh, be kind and courteous. Be kind and courteous to who? Hi, neighbors. Okay. Bringing, pe bringing people to G uh, Christ. Tell them about the gospel. All righty. Yeah, that's a better one. Tell your story. All righty. Yep. Tell your story. Make people see Jesus in you. Mm -hmm. All righty. Yeah. Uh, about praying for people, whether we like them or not. All righty. Vote and ask people to register. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Because we're not going to have an excuse this time. No. <laughs> we got a hot ticket. No. You know, I was... I was when they were talking about getting them out of there at first, I was, I didn't want to hear it. But, man, it seemed to be the best thing going right now. When they were, they were talking about letting Joe go, I said, oh, man, it's too late. We can't do that. But it's amazing how God works, you know? Yep. All the time. Yeah. Well, one yeah. of the things is feeding people part of it, that expansion. Yeah. 
Now, whether you're feeding them individually or whether you're feeding them as a group, yes. that's still a way of expanding God's kingdom. Yes. So what I want you to do is be thinking about some ways that we as a class can go about expanding God's kingdom. All righty? Okay. Yep. Okay. So that means that no matter where you are, in Arizona, Florida, in Detroit, in Virginia, in Florida, uh, in uh, Jacksonville, no matter where you are, there's something for you to do. Right. And what I want you to do is be thinking about that and just respond to the email that you got uh, about ways that we can expand God's kingdom. All righty? All righty. Let's get our hearts and minds prepared to go before God's throne of grace. Lord God Almighty, we come before you just like we are. We're not pretending. We're not trying to be somebody that we're not. We come acknowledging that you alone are the one worthy and deserving of praise of our lips and praise of our lives. We pray your blessing, Lord, when you believe in children everywhere, for those that are experiencing the aftermath of Debbie, and the ongoing flooding that's still taking place, along with tornadoes, for those that are experiencing the devastation that comes from fire. We need your comfort and consolation, Lord. Somebody has lost someone near and dear. We need you to continue to be the one who wipes away our tears. Keep us ever mindful, Master, that this is not home. Help us to be getting ready to go there and sensitize us to feel that need around us so that we can minister and serve in a way that puts a smile upon your face. Thinking about our brother and our sister, and we're wearing their clothes on our backs. We're eating their food. Keep us from being hoarders, selfish, stingy. Help us to be a conduit of your love, your mercy, and your grace to someone who has a need. Thank you, Lord, for our church and church family. Help us to remember why St. Stephen exists, and not the least of these is to expand God's kingdom. Primary to this all is that we want everybody to be able to worship the one who is the supreme being of the universe, mm-hmm. to magnify him with what we think, to magnify him with what we say, to magnify him with what we do. Amen. Amen. Lord, you've been so merciful, so kind, so loving. Mm-hmm. Cover us with that blood of your only begotten son. We'll be careful, Lord, to give you praise and glory now and ever. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.